So Dr. David Fawcett is our guest tonight. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. So, My pleasure. So we're going to get started. The, the um, first question is, what sets Seeking Integrity apart from other treatment programs? My first answer is Dr. David Fawcett and Dr. Rob Weiss, but let's elaborate. <laughs> well, Seeking Integrity, the programs are really unique in that, um, let me back up. Rob, of course, does sex addiction. My work has been with combined uh, sex and drug addiction, amphetamines particularly and sex, sexual acting out. Um, and when Rob and I have done a couple of pre-conference workshops over the years, we realized how much our programs overlapped. And we started thinking, gee, there, there's so much content that is similar. And, and there is a tremendous amount of uh, overlap between sex and porn addicts and chem, what, we, what we're calling chemsex addicts um, in terms of the, this combination, this fused drug and sex behavior. And a lot of it is inter intimacy disorder related, a lot of it is attachment focused, and we just had so much content that was overlapped, we decided to combine forces basically and create this program that is really unique in the country that can, can address both the sex and porn uh, addiction issues, but also can bring in the drug issues um, where, when drugs and sexual behavior are somehow paired or joined. And that could be not just say using amphetamines or cocaine with sex, but it could be using alcohol because someone may be have a lot of shame about their sexual orientation and can't uh, function sexually without a drug or alcohol. So uh, that's what really sets us apart, this awareness of um, how these things kind of interrelate and the, the fact that uh, there's a lot of intimacy and attachment disorders and the fact that we have, I think we added up 100 years of clinical experience. I've been working this for 30 years, Rob's been working for 30 years and we have other people as well. So we bring a lot of expertise and specialty uh, training to the program. We're both um, therapists, we're both uh, sex therapists, we're both uh, highly evolved in, in uh, addiction. So I think really it's a program that just can't be, it's, there's nothing like it. And I, I concur with that. And I think that one of the big differences is that you have these two amazing experts that are not just, they created the curriculum and then they've stepped away and you know people are using their names. It's their involved in the in the treatment now rob is sometimes in the office you are sometimes in the office but otherwise you are both um uh you know doing groups or involved with a clinical oversight the other thing that i think is really important is this is intentionally a small program you know this isn't a hundred bed program we don't pretend to treat everything you know i i talk to people and we're, we're not going like well over on that unit you're treating this and over on this unit we're treating that it's like this is a small program the ratio of clinicians to clients is is high and that's that's intentional so so you know th there are other programs and there's lots of people that'll say they treat, um, you know, the co-occurring. Often it's, we're going to treat the alcohol and chemical dependency and then we'll give lip service to treating sex addiction or they treat sex addiction and then we're going to send you over there and treat you for some chemical dependency. But to, to have it be, you know, as you identify the paired or fused behavior. And I think a lot of clients come thinking they don't have an issue with chemical dependency on any level and are um, probably a little surprised to understand that Oh, yeah, I, I drink heavily and all that, but it really does have something to do with their... And, and I would say it's normal for our clients to have been through treatment at several other places. And the treatment centers they went through didn't pick up on some of these underlying structures and relationships. And so, for example, a lot of my clients, they'll, they'll have gone to substance abuse treatment and everybody just assumes, well, the sexual problems will take care of themselves once you're clean and sober. And it doesn't. And so it takes an understanding of that that awareness. And I will say, I'm, I'm, I live in Fort Lauderdale, I'm, I'm in California quite often, but when I'm home, I'm participating in the unit three and four hours a day uh, with, like this, we assume, with individual sessions, with the team meetings, with uh, education lectures I give, even with group. So um, we're, both Rob and I are very, very hands-on involved. Yes, I agree with that. And I think that that really is one of the key things that sets you apart. Okay, I have listened to your podcast with Dr. Fawcett. That's because they thought Dr. Rob was going to be on there. So it's going to be the one with you and Dr. Rob, where you both talked about paired sex and drug addiction. Can you, uh, can that same Pavlovian classical conditioning concept apply to internal emotional states where the urge to sexually act out are triggered by stress, loneliness, emptiness, 
and the need for significance and belonging and how can we differentiate between a, a normal sexual need just being horny and that drive um, by negative emotions a complex question and i'm trying to find it in writing here tammy um it, just so it, I can... if you um click on q a it, you should be able to see it as well uh under the, the top one it, under the open one it's the top one uh it says my husband is a sex addict nope uh, scroll because i have a feeling you're not at the top you're probably at the bottom oh there we are sorry yeah, yeah. that's okay yeah, I'm just, just sorry. I'm I'm more a visual learner here than a the internal states are just Well, and that was a that was a complex one. So uh, okay, yeah. So one of the one of the things we find oftentimes is that uh, people people um, feel they have a high sexual desire, a high sexual drive. Uh, we've had a lot of clients who say, well, just, you know, I have to have sex four and five and six times a day. That's just kind of who I am. And when we really look at it, a lot of this, what they're interpreting as a sexual desire is really um, the need to manage some kind of emotion, uncomfortable emotion or to numb or to distance or to distract or dissociate. And so um, one of the big things people need to understand and learn is how to differentiate what is an authentic sexual desire versus um, really self-medicating through sexual acting out or through drugs. It's just the same way. It, it works the same way in the brain. And you mentioned the Pavlovian response. We, we quickly learn with these addictive behaviors, uh, particularly chemsex, sex, and porn, that those are great soothing uh, medications that we can use. And, but you know, clearly healthy sex isn't meant to be a medication. It's meant to connect us and, and um, be a pleasurable human experience. So differentiating those things is really important. But I think that has to start with understanding what these underlying emotions are. And I think a lot of people don't have an awareness of what's really going on. I'm an addict, I'm in recovery. And when I was in my addiction, I, um, I was clueless as to what I was feeling. I really didn't know. I, I kind of was feeling bad at the end. I think that was kind of it. But I, I really couldn't name what was going on. I couldn't name what, what I was hearing or feeling in other people, I was just kind of emotionally disconnected. And so I sought out my addictive behavior to kind of numb and soothe any discomfort. So I think it's really important to kind of, this Pavlovian conditioning you mentioned, this paired response that's really a brain function, uh, takes time to, to re-differentiate. So in the case of chemsex, uh, because of dopamine in the brain, uh, the, the sexual desire becomes fused with this intoxicated state and that people aren't really feeling authentic sexual desire they're just feeling the urge to um, get high and and distract themselves or numb themselves and so understanding that and breaking redifferentiating those things breaking that those bonds is really important and takes time um, time and practice and and with sex porn and chemsex or drugs those bonds are really strong and uh, it takes time to really manage all the triggers and cues. Uh, that's why, although we're an intensive treatment program, we almost always refer to a lower level of care and recommend ongoing self-care in terms of 12-step programs and therapy And because this is a long-range uh, solution. We are just kind of, what, what I think our great skill, one great strength is really bringing in people and assessing what's going on and, and kind of laying out the issues. And we get a good start on it in the work we do but then it has to be carried on in the long term. Well, and I, I too share that, you know, um, we aren't going to fix anybody in 14 days. So, it, I mean, that just doesn't happen. But you get a foundation and can really break through denial or shame or whatever, you know, whatever the things were that are, you know, are more likely to cause us to want to numb out. You know, I 100% agree with what you're saying, too, about the numbing out. I remember... Um, you know, when I first got into recovery, your people would ask me what I was feeling. I've shared this before, but you know, and I was like, I, I don't, I didn't know what I was feeling. I couldn't identify the emotion. Sure. I just knew it was really uncomfortable, even if it was a good feeling, which, you know, it was such a lesson for me to understand that when I'm numbing out to escape the not pleasant thing, I also numbed out and missed all the good stuff too. So I was just numb and not participating in real life. So, you know, I, I love, even when it's not fun, like when I get stressed out because there's, I'm all alone on a webinar. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd rather have that and have, have there be some unpleasant, but I get the, the joy of being connected to people and really experiencing, 
you know, life that that brings as well. So yeah, that's such a good point that I just want to underscore and that we are stressed by negative feelings, of course, by worry, anxiety, grief, um, all those things, but we're also stressed by, by happy things, you know, a wedding, a promotion, um, a birth of a child, all those things, they're happy events, but they also cause a lot of stress and equally are powerful triggers for people, which kind of surprises somebody sometimes. Oh, yeah. I can't tell you how often I've heard that, you know, the birth of a child, you know, a, a, a heterosexual couple, she's in the hospital, gave birth, and he goes and acts out because, I mean, that's just, and that, you know, like, it sounds horrible, but it also sounds from an addict standpoint, so understandable that it's like, yeah, this is way too overwhelming, and I need to not, you know, be present. So that's, you know, that's the choice. So, Okay. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, during the check-in for the SRH drop-in groups, we are asked to report on our spirituality. What is the purpose for that, and how can you tell if it is going well or not in that area? I'm going to answer this one unless you'd like to, but um, the, so my, um, my suggestion is ask the moderator, A, why they're asking. I mean, that there isn't a script that we give the moderator, so they kind of do their thing. Um, we give them, you know, some guidelines to, um, to guide the group and to make sure people are acting appropriately, et cetera. But, you know, I think a great question would be, so can you explain, you know, what you're asking and even to say, and how can I tell if things are, are going well, if I'm making progress. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if, if you are in a 12 step community, um, the 12 step is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We're not told that we're going to remove our, you know, our addiction or any of those other things, but the spiritual awakening gives us the opportunity to, um, to have a different life. Now that has nothing to do with religion. I want to be really clear. Spirituality and religion often I think are on different parts of the planet. You know, there's, you know, there's religiosity that is um, just rigid and doesn't, you know, isn't connected, but the spirituality that I've found in, you know, in recovery is meaningful and personal and um, is worth doing all the 12 steps. <laughs> so that's my mm -hmm. short answer. And I'll just add to that for me, spirituality in the beginning, especially helped me understand there was more than just me. And it, it didn't have, I, I was all confused about what it, what was out there beside, that was greater than me. For a time period, I just made the meeting something. But it, but it was really important for me to be able to step out of myself, out of my, my little universe, my addicted universe. And that was the first uh, time I was able to do that, with, with that awareness of spirituality. Yeah, somebody pointed out to me that my best me got me to the twelve step program, and it was kind of like, oh, oh yeah, that. <laughs> so, so I really don't have it all together. So, <laughs> um, next question: If I'm going to do recovery, I would, I really would like some healing, not just white knuckle it. Oh yes, how can I know if healing is actually happening? Wow, um, you'll know it. Um, at least after a while. I think in the beginning, uh, because there's so much confusion about things, uh, and there's, with, with chem sex especially, but also with sex and porn addiction, the, um, it's a matter of brain chemistry. Um, our dopamine systems are exhausted. In some cases, the, they're depleted, um, and it takes a lot of time for those systems to rework themselves and rewire, basically. Uh, for chem sex, for meth users, we know it can take up to two years, which is a very long time. Um, and so while you're in that state, especially early on, it's really hard to be able to discern what's going on. A lot of times people just kind of feel um, blah, or they're what we call anhedonic. They're unable to experience pleasure. That gradually changes. And I think um, people do know. People, I, that we, uh, the expression when I got sober was a pink cloud, right? You, all of a sudden everything feels better. And that's a little bit of an artificial reality as well. But I think... Um, You'll, you'll know internally. The other way, when I, before I was, got to that point, the way, the way I knew it was how people reacted to me. I could see it in other people and them being mirrors to me. And sometimes they told me, you're doing better. I didn't believe them, but I, you know, they'll act as if. Um, but it did indeed happen. And, but I just trust the process. You know, we have, on our, in the group room, we have this on the board, trust the process. And it, it really does work. It really does. I agree. And I think for me, part of it was I was less focused on the 
addiction and more focused on the tools to live in recovery. That that's when I started noticing a shift. I was, I was, um, you know, it wasn't just about not acting out. All of a sudden, it was about making the healthy connections. It was about doing things, and I and I was finding me the meaningful. Like I. Um, I, you know, I ended up, um, I was, I was young at the time when I got in recovery and I was doing social things with other people that were in recovery. And I was just enjoying that. It wasn't just cause I needed to be with recovering people. It was like, we were just having fun. And, and that was kind of a transition of, I could just be kind of okay in my own skin, which was so foreign for me. Um, uh, so, so I, you know, I agree with Dr. David, you will start noticing the other thing I, and I still do this in my recovery is I look back and I think about like, you know, I, you know, I kind of do the two years, like, am I in a different spot than I was two years ago? Yes. And do I believe that in two years I'll be at a different spot? Yes. Now, early on, it was like, you know, do I think I'm doing better this month than I did last month? Yes. You know, I mean, any little you know, I got through another day. Yay. I mean, whatever it is, if you can find and celebrate small victories, you know, that's I, because for me, and I think David will probably agree, you know, we're so hard on ourselves and always looking at how we fail. I, I did for me, you know, I was always like, I didn't measure up. I didn't do enough. I didn't whatever. And so when I could connect and go, you did something okay today, that was like huge. I would say too, if, if, only, the only thing we got from this was white knuckle recovery. No one would stay around. Correct. Um, you just, that's a phase. That's a process. And it, it's gradually and sometimes quickly replaced by many, many gifts in terms of the social connection Tammy referred to in terms of um, just feeling better and healing. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a temporary phase. Just allow yourself to go through it and, and recover further. Yeah, well, and I think there are some people that kind of white knuckle it forever. And they're, you know, like in the drunk world, they call them, you know, the, the dry drunks, they're still the same kind of people, they're just nastier, because they're, you know, the one thing that they used to do that kind of soothed them, they no longer do. So, so it's a miserable being if that's all you do. Right. As a related uh, powerlessness or unmanageability in my mind. Yes, yes. So the next question is, I'm the girlfriend of a sex addict. My boyfriend did a lot of really great things before disclosure, gifts, romantic gestures. I thought we had a great sex life, et cetera. Now I constantly find myself questioning who he is. I wonder if uh, he did those things to cover up for his acting out. How do I determine what was really him so I can determine whether this is someone I want to spend my life with? He's been in solid recovery for the past two months, and I see that he's really starting to heal. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's uh, any specific, there's no, there's no blood tests or lab tests or any objective uh, criteria for that. Um, I think it's going to take time. One of the big issues always with partners, especially of sex addicts, is trust and regaining that trust and really kind of, um, which is perfectly understandable. You consider the trauma people have gone through of discovering uh, the person they thought they knew uh, in, in an intimate way is maybe not who they thought were at all, and that shakes everything up. And so um, it's absolutely normal for you to be kind of going through and questioning and wondering. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't give you an answer for that, really. It's going to take time, I think, to, to just uh, take that out. Two months is a great start. It's going to take longer. Um, and I think uh, it's going to take a lot of communication uh, between the two of you to, to discern that. And ultimately, he may... Um, be able to figure that out. Uh, it's not unusual for addicts to cover their tracks, but it's also not unusual for addicts to fall in love. So um, I think it's, it's going to be hard to say. I would just um, encourage you to kind of put that question on the shelf, though, and uh, give the process time and not try to figure out what the motives have been or are, but just kind of um, get the support, it's, take this time to, to build the recovery resources for yourself that you have, the support that you need, the, any kind of assistance you need in terms of therapy or help for the, the trauma you've gone through, and let him work his program. And then uh, gradually, I think, I would say usually not before 90 days, it's, it's useful then to start maybe having some conjoint therapy sessions or, or couples counseling or some kind of third person that can facilitate communication to start getting some of that out. But um, I, I think sometimes people kind of agonize themselves unnecessarily of the motives. 
and those may never be known, even even to your partner. Um, and so I think just give it time, trust the process, and um, and share what you're feeling as well, and expect the same. At this point, I think you can expect um, authenticity in terms of emotional expression uh, back and forth, and I think that's important. Um, that'll be important marker for you along the way. I would really encourage you to get Dr. Rob's book out of the doghouse because it talks about rebuilding trust and that's what you're looking to do. And there's some really solid um, uh, practical tools that you can use to rebuild trust. So that may be a, a you know, a good uh, start for you too. And do please join the drop-in groups for betrayed partners, et cetera, because I think you'll find support, you know, and the other people in there can, you know, give you some feedback and guidance as well. So I'm going to flip over to the chat because I know you like to follow around. So, uh, so uh, 50 days ago, I found out my boyfriend of two and a half years was visiting massage parlors and had sex with at least five women he met on dating apps. Once I confronted him with the text I found on his phone, our worlds blew up. He has joined a church recovery 12-step group, but refuses to get to a sex addiction therapist. I truly love him, but I don't know if I can risk being with him unless he receives one-on-one -on -one therapy. I'm a healthy woman with no addictions, but I feel at risk if I stay with him uh, physically and emotionally. I don't want to lose the relationship and the man I love, but I don't want to lose my mind worrying about his addiction. He refuses further disclosure and answering um, any of, more of my questions about his cheating. I feel almost more hurt by his lack of fully answering my questions and tired of being blamed for setting him back in his recovery when he has never answered my questions honestly. Thoughts? Wow. I'm um, sorry. That's a really tough um, situation. Um, a couple things. I think uh, sometimes people take uh, maybe the less complicated or easier method. Uh, I'm not saying this group is that, but I think also sometimes people kind of um, can jump over the hard work and try to try to jump into the solution too soon. And I'm not saying people need to suffer unnecessarily, but I think uh, recovery is hard work and it takes some digging out of old core beliefs and negative things and getting honest and sharing what we've done and disclosing what we've done. All that, that is a process. And I think um, it's one that requires uh, some openness and, and openness with the process and with therapy. Um, so I, I'm, I'm concerned that he has about his refusal to get the kind of professional support that I think would best suit the issue that, that you're talking about. Um, and I, uh, sorry, I'm just reading this again. Okay, and then in terms of the disclosure, um, disclosure is a really complicated thing. Uh, and it's something that for sex addicts um, in treatment, we disclosure is a very formal process and it's not something that's done right away. Um, it's it's uh, in the effort to to gather patterns and to be as thorough as possible. What what we want to avoid are what we call rolling disclosures, where somebody will get caught or say something, and well, yeah, I, I slept with you know two women, and then uh, hoping that'll kind of quiet the waters, and then something else happens, gets caught again. Well, the, the story expands, and it's the same way, by the way, with any um, substance abuse person. If I'm doing an intake assessment. You know, how, how often do you drink twice a week? Well, on the next day, well, really it's five days a week. And then, you know, then we find out there's heroin in the mix. It, it kind of expands. And, and what we don't want, that's torturous for the partner, right? To, to sort of get this, okay, you kind of deal with something and then something else drops and then something else drops. So the disclosure process is one that, that is formal. It's done with professionals on board for both the partner and uh, the, the client, the addict. And uh, it's a really formal process that, that we take a lot of care to do. So um, I think I would, it's okay maybe that um, he's not disclosing all that right now, but I would think in the context of, that should be in the context of a professional journey toward health, not just kind of refusing to talk. And so um, there's items for concern there, there are. And, and you are not to blame uh, for his recovery or his downfall. Yeah, uh, that's all on him. So um, I'd encourage you to get support of your own. Uh, go to some of the, the partner meetings, uh, either al or some of the S, the COSAs, or, or some other meeting that you might find helpful, where you can talk to other people that have been in this position and get a lot of support. I think we find tremendous wisdom in uh, the, the lived experiences of people in those groups. 
and, and I concur with the disclosure. It's, you know, it, just, just having him tell you details is um, traumatic. I, in fact, a lot of people, I call them the vomit disclosures because, you know, somebody wants to unburden and then they just tell everything and now I feel better and what, what's wrong? Why are you traumatized? I don't understand. You know, we're, now we have a, now we have trust. No, no, you don't. You have trauma. Um, uh, so, you know, I mentioned out of the doghouse earlier, if he really is serious about rebuilding trust, it talks about disclosure in there, but there's a process. And like Dr. David was saying, you know, he, he would with his, with his sponsor, with his therapy team, whatever, um, be preparing for that disclosure. And there'd be the, you know, the history, but also categorizing things. So it isn't like the nitty gritty details, but kind of categories. And, you know, during my acting out, I, you know, I, uh, I had unprotected sex with, you know, three prostitutes and whatever, and I spent X amount of money, whatever, whatever, but it really should be done with, um, uh, with a professional. So, but yeah, his, his resistance is, is troubling, you know, and um, typically if you try to push everything under the, if you try to tuck addiction up on the shelf, addiction is very patient. It waits, it'll wait, you know, until a vulnerable moment. And, you know, then all of a sudden people are like, well, how did this happen? You know, because they're, you know, they're acting out again. So, um, okay, next question. My spouse is a sex addict who has been in recovery for six months. I asked him to close the door on his prior acting out relationships. He said he would, even though he was scared to do it and would be difficult to get their uh, contact information. What should the next steps be? We're living separately and I'm on my own recovery path. I'm sorry, Tammy, could you read the beginning of that again? Because sure. I yeah, so my it's at the so scroll to the top. My spouse is a sex addict who has been in recovery for six months. I asked him to close the door on his prior acting out relationships. I think that means like oh, I've I'm I'm partners getting or... yes, I'm getting rid of all the contact information. He said Got he it. would, even though he was scared to do it and it would be difficult to get their contact information. So I guess it's asking that not just delete and block, but to contact them and saying, I'm no longer going to be, and here's why. So, so does that make sense? Yeah. So that's really important to, to break all those uh, former contacts and relationships. Uh, uh, just, it's just, <laughs> what's the point of keeping those, right? The, the point of keeping those is to kind of um, hedge your bets or to hold out, or I, I can't think of a good reason why those would be valuable. And, um, the same thing goes with uh, people in, in drug recovery. People don't get rid of their dealer's numbers or um, old using buddies. Uh, and inevitably, Murphy's Laws, they will text or they will call. And so I think it's really important for all those things to be kind of dumped and, and a clean break from that. That's, that's one thing I think is really um, critical, that, the, that any kind of those former relationships be, be tied. And again, I would encourage you to um, get support for yourself here in terms of um, how to process feelings you're experiencing, what kind of tools there might be for you in terms of dealing with that, communication or otherwise. But a lot of those can be found in, in the Out of the Doghouse book and in the partner meetings uh, and in other therapy groups. Actually, if you have a partner's, if you're lucky enough to have a group where um, it's facilit a facilitated group, that can be even more useful. And there is one of the um, partner uh, moderators does have a pro-dependence online therapy group. So, I mean, it is, you, you know, you would be getting, you know, coaching and therapy from her. If you are interested in that, you can um, email me and I'll give you information. I know she's starting one a few weeks ago. She was talking about she's starting one in three weeks. I've lost track of time. I don't think it's happened yet, but if you're interested in that, but there are other therapists that also, I would, if you haven't read pro dependence and you are a partner, please read it. It really looks at um, loving someone with addiction from a different lens than codependency where you're part of the problem and you're, you know, you need to work on your issues, et cetera. Um, you know, it really it talks about, well, you love this person. And, you know, when you got involved with them, no one gave you the manual on how to deal with an addict. So, um, so I, I would encourage you to look at it from that standpoint. And I would also hope your husband has somebody to talk to and say why it's so difficult for him to release those. What, what's that about? And that's, that's not for you to work with him or, or fix or not, but it's something I, I would suggest that he gets some uh, uh, start questioning about it as well for himself. My thought is I always have the uh, visual of a picket fence. When you're straddling that fence, um, those pickets are painful. So, so it's not a, a comfortable position to be in. So, 
So Dr. Fawcett, this one you're going to have to help me with. I don't know if I'll be able to pronounce it correctly. I've read lots of articles about the benefits of awahaska as a helpful tool. Okay, thank you. Um, as a helpful tool in treating addiction, specifically sex addiction. Do you have thoughts on this? Um, I do. Um, ayahuasca uh, is a is a drug, is a plant um, in in the Amazon and Central America that is a hallucinogenic. Basically, um, it is treated. Uh, it's not illegal in this country, but uh, it's done in this country. I know places in Florida that do it. But the process is very ritualized. Uh, you drink it. You stay up all night. You hallucinate. You vomit a lot, and it's kind of this very. Uh, um, uh, life-changing experience according to people that have gone through it. The problem is it can be very dangerous um, and there's some very bad results. I had a client um, for methamphetamine who went to Costa Rica for an ayahuasca ceremony to try to get cured and ended up hallucinating and stealing a Jeep and jumping out of it while I was going 30 miles an hour. And just It was a really bad time and he wasn't properly monitored uh, and he, he got really physically ill in the process and had some head injury. So my, uh, I don't recommend it. Um, ibogaine is another one uh, that we see a lot of, um, an African root that is used. Um, that one, uh, I should say both ayahuasca and ibogaine are actually getting some funding for research studies now to see their impact on addiction because it's thought perhaps if they're used in a kind of pharmaceutical grade under very uh, careful conditions, uh, there might be some benefit. That's, we're a long way from that. The only options right now are these kind of uh, wild west um, shamanic en endeavors uh, that I wouldn't put a lot of stock in. Uh, the, the people I know that have gone through it have only ended up being more traumatized mm -hmm. uh, on top of their addiction by the experience. The phrase easier, softer way comes to mind. I'm looking for something that will fix it really fast. So. Although throwing up all night and hallucinating doesn't sound like <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah, I'd look for, but no, yeah. no. Okay. At the moment, I don't feel at liberty to spend the money on a one-on-one -on -one therapy. I have no income for almost a year and it continues. I know it is recommended, but how can I work on my own healing of early trauma? Wow. Uh, that's a tough situation because trauma really, um, by its definition almost, uh, requires someone who's trained to deal with it. When, when we're in trauma, when we're in the experience, it's very difficult for us to kind of have an observer self or an ob objectivity about it. We need someone else to kind of be pointing patterns out and seeing it because we're living it. Trauma re-engages that uh, really deep part of the brain that's all about emotional experience, and it has no time stamp. The, 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 the brain is feeling panic, and it doesn't know that it's 2019, it still thinks it's 1982. And so um, when you're in that experience, it's almost impossible to really get a lot of benefit. Um, I think what I would suggest uh, is to really, if you don't know already how to do mindfulness meditation, I would suggest maybe a book on that. Um, or some kind of YouTube probably has, it's very easy. Mindfulness meditation is simply being in the present moment, not in the past, not in the future, being aware of what's going on and not judging it. And so it can be as simple as, you know, I'm sitting at my table, the lamp is on, I'm feeling hungry, what I'm, I'm worried about Tammy and her, her anxiety, now I'm anxiety. <laughs> so that's just living the moment. And not, I'm saying, you, what an idiot I am for feeling anxious. None of the self, negative self-talk. But just those simple patterns, first of all, have been shown to change our brains. They rewire our brains in very healthy ways. But also it teaches you the tools to become really self-aware because one of the things trauma does is just disconnect us from all our, um, like it's like being underwater and not knowing which way is up, you know, all our gauges are kind of off. And so mindfulness meditation can give you the tools to start noticing and noticing like, gee, that's funny or what's that discrepancy or what's that about? And, and by asking those questions, you can do a lot to give yourself from relief from the effects of trauma. But ultimately, when you can't afford it, I think it's really important for you to get some professional guidance in that area as well. And there are some that, that are not long-term, like an EMDR, like, you know, uh, I don't even know how many sessions, but it doesn't take, it's not a forever thing, but you can have some um, really pointed EMDR, se EMDR <coughs> sessions that can help you. Um, it, and it doesn't remove the trauma, but it helps not to um, 
to relive it. It's like, you, you know, you can look at it without feeling it. But yeah, I was thinking the same thing when Dr. David was talking about um, the mindfulness, because, you know, if you start feeling like you're going to dissociate, you start feeling like you're going to panic or whatever, if you've got the tools to be able to do a mindfulness, you know, and, and come back to the moment and know that you're in the present and all of those things, it can be really beneficial to not, you know, to not get sucked into the, in the trauma tornado. And just a couple tips I found just to, if you're doing yourself, when people are having some kind of trauma response, we numb, we dissociate, we, we fall out of our body. And so I think it's, I found it really useful to have clients take a drink of cold water or hot water or use a hot pack or a cold pack, depending on just what feels right. And it can somehow reconnect um, quickly, like immediately. And uh, so little tips like that are, are useful, I think. Um, and but to say about EMDR, because I'm an EMDR practitioner, um, sensor eye movement, desensitization reprocessing, it's a very effective trauma uh, resolution treatment. And Tammy's right, it, it can be as brief as two, sometimes six or seven, eight sessions, but relatively brief considering modes of therapy. And so I highly recommend it. Okay, I am a single gay male sex and porn addict in anticipating a future relationship. Oh, I'm sorry. In anticipating a future relationship, one concern I have is how with past partners, I sometimes wanted sex more than that partner. And that came with a degree of frustration for me. I recognize that I cannot treat a partner as a sex object, but that energy has been in me before. So how does someone navigate this kind of scenario? Well, you know, I guess the nature of um, couples relationships is that there are um, different speeds and different levels of desire and, and differences in general. And I think one of the um, issues and rewards actually of a, of a mature couple is navigating those in terms of communication. For me, it comes down to communication. And um, I think uh, in, in my experience with, with partners, especially as, as a sex therapist and then my clients, when people can um, start to build the intimacy part. And by that, I mean the non-sexual part, although of course sex is part of intimacy, but, but to really focus on um, touch and exchange and other kinds of intimacy and warmth and connection being the operable word there, um, that kind of frustrated level of sexual desire seems to diminish and, and, and um, or at least readjust to a, a par with the, the partner. It's like almost, uh, they talk about when two people come into a room, sometimes their heartbeats kind of synchronize. I found that kind of in that sexual desire and emotional state as well, given time. So I think it's really important to, um, if you're, and you just talk about objectifying your partner, if you're doing that, if you're really focused on the sex part of intimacy, um, to really try to reconnect in other ways. There is a, a wonderful exercise that Masters and Johnson created. Um, they were sex, uh, therapists for couples uh, called Sensate Focus, S-E-N-S-A-T-E, the word focus. And it's just a, an intimacy communication exercise where one partner pleases the other, and it's not sexual initially at least, but they, they may tickle or touch or um, rub, and the partner says, that's good, that's not, that's stop, too hard, too soft. And it's this amazing communication that kind of um, soothes some of that a raw sexual energy and into a more full emotional experience. So uh, there's many things to do like that, but I, I would take the focus off the sex uh, and the orgasm and focus more on the other issues of connection with your partner. Yeah, I think those are great ideas. I was also thinking that uh, John Taylor did a webinar a couple weeks ago on negotiation and, you know, it was, um, it, it was, it was good. It wasn't, and I'm saying it because it wasn't just about negotiating, you know, well, David, I want this and you know, whatever it, it was about. It made, it made me think of what do I really want? You know, and if it's, I really want to be close to this person. Is it, is sex going to be the thing that's going to get me there? Or is it really, I just want to, Agreed. like you're talking about. So, so I think it would be helpful um, for lots of reasons. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I really appreciate about John Taylor's is he gives you practical tools on, you know, on relationships beyond just a romantic relationship. Um, but, you know, like just relationships, li living, living better, you know, um, work and kids and what, whatever, uh, whatever that isn't just with ourselves, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you may find something like that really helpful as well. So, 
Okay, the next one. Are some addictions harder to overcome? I want to say yes. I keep hearing that sex addiction is harder to overcome than drug addiction or alcoholism. What are your thoughts, David? Um, you know, any addiction is hard to overcome, but I, I agree that, um, and this is based on just clinical experience I've had of the, the people we treat at Seeking Integrity, the sex addiction, porn addiction, and chemsex really all interact in the same way in the brain. It's very difficult if you were to take MRIs or PET scans of a brain on one or the other, you couldn't really differentiate. It's all the same. And because all of them have this common factor of really attaching to very deep um, primal instincts that we as humans have and hijacking that system, it's really hard to, to, to break. And so I think other drugs, alcohol, I'm, an, I'm a recovering alcoholic, not an easy addiction to, to get over, but it works on a different part of the brain and I, or in different ways. And I think it's easier to kind of break that connection. The way sex and porn and chemsex addictions interact with that early part of the brain makes them extremely difficult. So uh, yeah, I think they are, they are harder, frankly. Well, I think, I think for me, the biggest difference is um, that with alcohol and drugs, like sobriety is, I just have to, it's complete abstinence. So, you know, I don't have to learn to have a relationship with alcohol and drugs. I have to learn how to have have them not be part of my life. But with food or sex, it's, it's like, you don't, you can't, if you have a food addiction, you can't just like, well, I'm not going to eat, you know, so you have to learn to have a relationship with it. And ideally, you know, and I think one of the, the problems has been with sex addiction is people go abstinence is sobriety. And that's not what we, we, you know, we really want it to be about healthy connection. And so yeah. you know, it's learning to have that, have those relationships, like the previous person was asking, how do I learn to do this in a real situation with somebody that I do want to care about and, and have a relationship with and not it just be about sex? I think that that's a great question. And that's what we're learning to, to, you know, talk about. So, so you know, beyond the cravings and everything else, it's also the, how do I live in this world? It, you know, with, and, and, it, and be able to experience that on a different level in a different way. Right. Right. So next question, is there such a thing as masturbation that is not compulsive? So I guess one of the important things about sex addiction and it really to what Tammy was just saying about needing to incorporate sex into our lives uh, in recovery as well, but it's it's not the behaviors themselves. There's nothing inherently wrong with masturbation or um, any kind of sex for that matter. Well, what the problem is in the behavior and the acting out. So an addict takes that behavior and kind of misuses it uh, or redirects it in a way that's not healthy. So, um, for example, then in recovery plans, some masturbation might be a, a a no-go for somebody, some, you know, something that absolutely lets someone know that they're in, they're slipping or in relapse. Uh, for someone else, it might not be in that inner circle that we talk about, but more maybe a slippery slope or something that um, that helps them feel good about themselves. So it, it's not the behavior itself that defines whether it's a problem or not. It's it's how it's used or misused um, by the addict. So and compulsivity is a behavior that can be attached to almost anything. Uh, we can take really um, I can, you know, take eating kale and I guess there might out there somewhere be a compulsive kale eater. I don't know. And that was a bad example, but, uh, yeah, we can take any good habit and make it a bad thing. Correct. Now I thought of chocolate, you think of kale. So that just tells everybody where we go with things. I go to, <laughs> the, I need chocolate and you're talking kale. So he's clearly a healthier eater than me. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so well, <laughs> both ways. To, to, I was gonna say to those who have been on here before, there's not a big surprise with that. So, um, but you know, I was thinking too, um, uh, you know, about the the you know, compulsive behavior. You know, one of the things with addiction and compulsive behavior, it's a maladaptive way. And I've told people before that you know that are reaching out for help. You know, it's like like when they start sharing their history, you go, thank goodness you got an addiction. It was probably the thing that saved you because, you know, they, they that was a safe place for them to go. It was a way to dissociate from from the unsafe world that they were living in. So, um, 
so there are lots of, I mean, yes, masturbation or anything else like Dr. David was talking about, you know, can be fine for some people and it can be a problem for others. So it really is, you know, the intent. If it's, I'm doing this to numb out and escape and I can't deal with any life that, you know, that is likely a problem. So, um, but, you know, and I think there are people particularly with that, that maybe it's not for 90 days, you know, maybe there's a period of like no masturbation for 90 days while we, you know, look at, while, you know, the brain cools off and we figure out what's going on. And then we, we look at it again. And, you know, so some of those behaviors for people, you know, could, could have different meaning at different points. That's a really important point, Tammy, because I think it's, it's really important to just kind of, um, a friend of mine in recovery says, clear the palate, just kind of um, have a period there before those things are reinitiated. And no one has died from lack of sexual activity. People think that they might, but they haven't. So that I, I don't know of any known cases. So. <laughs> So any qu other questions? I think we, we've cleared the, we've cleared the, um, the list. Wow. So, I know. And it's just, it's on the top of the hour. So I think if, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You don't know how grateful I am that you dropped what you were doing and came to my rescue and um, were willing to spend your evening with this great group of people. Oh, there's a question. Oh. So. And my, my kale has gone uneaten. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. So okay. what would compulsive masturbation look like? That's a, that's a fair question. So. so compulsive masturbation would look, compulsivity is really defined by kind of losing control over both the thought and then carrying it out. And so I think it, it's, there's a kind of a frenzy to it and, and um, uncontrollability and uh, impulsivity. That there's a kind of a franticness about it but it, it, the the definition is really being unable to kind of control the behavior so however that out of control looks is how it would look there so there are um people that uh masturbate at work where their job would be in jeopardy if they got caught you know per, they're they're doing this in a place where they could get discovered um so th that would be a problem there um was a, a case where there was a physician who between every client was masturbating that's com that's compulsive you know and so 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 if it's taking over um you know if it's not if it's problematic, if, you know, if, if there's risk involved, there are people that are masturbating so much that they have physical um, uh, issues, uh, uh, porn induced erectile dysfunction. You know, it, it probably isn't, as, you're doing it because it's fun. If you're doing it to numb out, if you're doing it to escape, all of those things are, you know, are problematic. So. Uh, yes, and the comment is female sex addicts will compulsively masturbate until they have injuries. And, and males too. Right. You're right. So, right. so okay. Um, oh, thank you. Hey, you guys knocked it out of the park. Great job. Say hi to Rob for us. I will do thank that. So. I just want to put in the plug for my webinar on, on Wednesday evenings this same time, addiction Q&A. So yes. um, very similar to this format. Uh, so please, please join me if you have a free hour that on Wednesday evenings. Yes. And he, w we, so he will give some information, but then he will also, um, answer questions. There is one more question. So no. this will be the last question I promise. So I remember having my first orgasm at four or five, then some level of masturbation thereafter that this is young. What would be the possible reason for that? So one of the, um, myths is that children, uh, don't have sexual experience or feelings. And uh, it's very typical or not unusual at all for a child to masturbate like that. Um, and even have orgasm per se in terms of a physical response. So that's not really an unusual experience. If you talk, most children, they may not be aware of it. Uh, they may just, may just feel good. Um, but by definition, they're actually masturbating. So it's not really unusual at all. I, Thank I you. Great information. So thank you again, Dr. David. I so appreciate it. Thank you all Pleasure. for joining us. Thank you for your patience and grace. We appreciate it. And um, uh, so Dr. David will be on Wednesday night and um, Dr. Rob will be back next Monday night. I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, Dr. David will be gracious and join us again. So <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye.